Good morning, everyone. As many of you know, I'm just, almost literally just returned from three weeks in India. And I'm going to try very hard this morning to not only talk about that trip, uh, because we have a satsang coming up um, after Sai Ganesh gets back. I'm sorry, I don't know when it is, but uh, there's so much to share about it. And um, perhaps I'm just being dishonest because part of it is that it's so beyond words. It's, it will be a little challenging, but let's hope that some of the consciousness and the energy and all of what happened there can come through to all of you. I really made a concerted effort everywhere we went. It's such a sacred, sacred country, and we were truly on a spiritual pilgrimage everywhere from the first day right up to the last minute of my time. It wasn't just, it was fun, but it wasn't just meant to be fun. It was a very deep, deep dive. And everywhere we went, I remembered all of you. I really, I told Helen this morning, she was saying, the school's doing great. But she said, like she would, the school can use our, your prayers. And I said to her, everywhere, I prayed for the school everywhere. I prayed for individuals. I prayed for our congregation. Um, and with every dunk in the Ganges and every Ganesha that I decided to buy and bring back, uh, a lot of them, <laughs> um, there was a prayer for all of you. So that is the most important thing, is that we traveled together. I've said this before, and I remember Dambara saying to me years ago when he was here, I remember right exactly where we were out on the green in the community. But he said, you know, when any of us goes on a spiritual pilgrimage and we dive deep, we all go on that pilgrimage. It really struck me then, probably wasn't that many years ago, but I feel like I was much newer on this path. And this time, I just felt that. I felt we were all together there. And so if suddenly your life is changing, <laughs> you'll know why you just had three weeks in India. Yeah. And the other, I want to thank uh, Karen and Navashan. I did not know what the reading was yet, but I was sitting somewhere and listening to one of our choirs, one of our soloists, sing, O oh Master. And I thought, if you really want to talk about truth in any way, ever, it's got to be preceded by that song. I don't think I ever heard that song in the same way. But if you go back and read the words and you read this reading, you see it is perfect. It's one of those times where we could all just sing the song a few times, and that could easily be our sermon. And it was sung beautifully, so thank you. Um, this is, a, of course, as they all are, a very interesting reading because it feels like it just tells us the simple truth. Truth is one and eternal. And that any of the very great masters would know that, and as we always say, it's never the masters who are arguing with themselves at all. It wasn't Jesus who's confused about the truth, and it wasn't Jesus who was confused that there were other paths and other great teachers, but as we know, many who have come after him have gotten very confused about that. And they get confused because it's so easy for us to slip into the egoic side of that, that we know the way. And pretty quickly, Maya grabs us, and it feels like that is the only way. And 
you know, we've seen this many times with uh, religious zealots, and not even zealots, but just people who feel you, I mean, I've seen it in Christianity, I've seen it in Judaism, up close and personal. I've seen it or read it in the news and in newspapers about Muslims. It's everywhere. It can happen. It doesn't happen with the, the avatar who's coming to tell us the truth. So here we are at a very interesting time for all of us in this shift. And we're just at such an early time in this shift from Kali Yuga to Dwapara Yuga, where people are beginning to see that it's not the form. Now, many people aren't, of course. We still see people holding on to the form. And unfortunately, some of the leaders of the great religion, religions still do that. But there's a shift. It's happening. Some may not know it. Some of us may know it and not be totally there yet. But we are beginning to see that it's the energy and the consciousness that will take us to real truth, to real peace, to the only place out of the ego and into that place of super consciousness where we can find truth. We will never find truth when we're doing the I, me, mine, that wonderful little song that Swamiji created, when we're in that egoic state of consciousness, we simply can't find truth. It doesn't exist there, but it exists in all great religions. It exists because it's the foundation of all of creation, of all of what we know, all of what brings us joy and uplifts our spirit. There lies truth. And it doesn't matter what religion we are. How could it matter? It's not about a religion. In fact, that wonderful statement of masters, that it's great to be born into religion, but it's unfortunate to die in one, meaning we can't stay confined to the dictates of any one religion, that we're trying to move um, beyond that. Um, then we see that in uh, great teachers other than on uh, those on our path. That's the beauty of connecting with a Saint Francis, he himself even got confused. Because look at the time in the 1100s when he was born, it was so materialistic. It was so uh, etched in stone, granite. This is how things are spo supposed to be. So he himself has a vision of Christ. Christ appears to him and says, Francis, rebuild my church. And Francis alone starts dragging huge stones. He's in that form. And then it comes to him, Francis, that's not what I meant. I meant you have to rebuild my church because everything that would allow spirit to flow, everything that would allow people to find true joy, to become ecstatic with God is being blocked by this form. So it happened then. Fortunately, Francis awakened to that truth. It's exactly what happened when Jesus came. Jesus came and it was said, we have a reading every year, one of the readings is that Moses came and brought the law. And as you know, and as I've said, the Jews follow many laws every day, 600 and some of them. Imagine how confining that is. Imagine, where do you have time to let your heart open and soar? 600 and some laws. But Jesus came to bring us truth and grace. And that truth is what Swamiji is trying to speak to us about today. And he says, it's, 
it can be found in every religion. One of the, I'm just going to tell a couple of stories now, but there's many more, so come to the satsang. But they're so perfect. One of the first things that we did when we arrived in India is we went to Babaji's cave. It's a pretty powerful experience. You're sitting there and you're trying to say to yourself, Babaji sat here. He was here. And the first, <clears throat> the first experience of life is a dream comes then. You can't make it make sense that you're right there where he was. But in fact, you are. And we were meditating. And then a group of about, I think, 13 YTT people, um, no, YSS, I'm sorry, YSS people come. Now, many of us would know that there was the potential for that to not be great. We've been living this experience of Ananda SRW, some of what that means. Hopefully it's dissolving as Dwapara comes, and I really mean that, and I fully believe it is. But, so here come these YSS people, and we tell them, they notice, I think they said to us right away, are you Ananda? And they got totally joyful. We mentioned Swami Kriyananda's name, and they were so happy. And then we realized that we could all chant together. I mean, we're sitting on the side of a mountain near a cave. It's not like this. And Sai Ganesh had brought this little portable harmonium. And I, I hope there's some way for me to show some videos. There are probably some very good videos. Maybe they've even already made it around. But with more joy than I can put into words, truth is one and eternal, there was never a moment of who are you, who are you, oh, he's taught you differently than our teachers taught us. That's not really our path. He's made it up, he's developed his own path. No, not even for a moment. We're on the side of the mountain joyfully singing all of Master's chants. It was so beautiful. Everybody was with that truth. Now, we do have the same teacher there. So we knew the same chants, and we came together. But it wasn't a given. It wasn't a given. But everybody was diving deep. Everybody was being affected by Babaji's presence, by that which lies beneath all of the uh, egoic misunderstandings of what our teachers have been trying to tell us that we see everywhere. And then we went up to a place called Badrinath. And uh, that's a story that a way to be told, the getting there. But you actually do feel like you're climbing forever to be closer to God. Now, I was saying before to a few people, in India, in fact, one of the... Um, try and think of who it was. I don't know if it was one of the Indian leaders along the way or an American in Kolkata, I think. Not all of us went there. But he was describing, must have been an American, adjusting to India. And he said, yeah, I got the elbow technique really down. <laughs> because you cannot fathom. You have to look at pictures. It will be beyond your ability to know it if you haven't been there. And I'm sorry, but it's simply the truth. We're limited by what we've seen and what we've experienced. But as I said just before to the ministers, there's 8 million people in New York. Many of you have been to New York City. And you know what it can be like on Fifth Avenue at noon. It's hard walking. In Mumbai, there's 26 to 28 million people. I mean, just imagine. And the same thing is true in Kolkata and in Delhi. And if you try and be polite 
about moving, forget it. You would be dead and you'd probably kill 10 other people. <laughs> so you really have to learn how to move through India. It's a life-threatening experience. <laughs> And I mean the physical life. And you're laughing, but anybody who's been in India knows. And India has changed dramatically. Whatever people remember it. I hadn't been to India since 2012. And I just could not believe it. It's a different place. Anyway, we were up in Badrinath. And we, Sai Ganesh had met a priest that allowed us to get into this very holy experience within this huge temple there that sits underneath this, it's all so sacred, underneath this very sacred mountain. Now, anyway, the experience in the temple at 4.30 in the morning, mind you, for three hours, is that every day they change the clothes on this murti that's, um, uh, Narayan, basically. But it's all really about Babaji. Don't ask me to explain any of it. It's, I asked Sai Ganesh five times, tell me again, but it just won't stay here. But it stayed here, and this is why I'm telling you. 4.30 in the morning, there's supposed to be people who had paid a certain amount of money to go in. Everybody else has to just stay out and just be herded through. They walk through these lines and they get where the Mortis there and they pronom and they move on. But some of us were allowed to go in and sit for three hours and watch the whole thing. Very sacred, they tell me. Though again, I can hardly remember to tell you who the Morty was. Then they change it and it's called the Abhishank and it's just, we've seen it here with People have seen it. We've done something when you install a morti, it's called, and you pour ghee over it and buttermilk and you throw flowers at it and rice at it and all the time. And then the same priest is taking care of it and cleaning it. Anyway, I cannot sit on the ground right now because my knee uh, just won't allow me. So I walked around India with this little stool. So the priest said, you can go in, but you can only sit in the back because otherwise I would obstruct the view of everybody. He said, but get all the way to the back and in the middle. So all of a sudden, it's like the bell rings and these crowds take off. And they had been so polite to me. I was the only white-haired person in all of India. Really, I mean it, Indian women do not let their hair go white. There's no white hair there, none that I saw. So everybody was always so polite to me. But I'll tell you, it was like a stampede, and nobody cared if the little old lady died. <laughs> but I said, that's, I stopped and I said, literally, Shanti, what would Swamiji do? You are Indian. And I, I'm just about my first experience. <laughs> and I got that stool right to the back. Now, I'm telling you this because I don't know what went on. It went on in Hindi. It was, I mean, it's hard to explain and it doesn't really matter. But I never knew what was happening. But a group of Indian women surrounded me. And they took me in. It was like a sisterhood. None of them, nobody I ever met in, up there anywhere had ever heard of Yogananda. They don't pray like we do. They don't honor God in the same way we do. They just love singing the name of God over and over. That's what they do. It's totally different from us. Totally. And we didn't understand each other. But they got me, and they held on to me, and they made sure I never missed. Mind you, we're in this, I'm on my little chair like this, no room to move. Then a couple of them were like, now you stand. Here, eat this, take this, give it back, do this. Such sweetness, such sweetness. It didn't matter that I was American and they were Indian, that they worshiped differently. We, had, we were all living in those moments of truth. Now, I am describing the whole experience was 
otherworldly, but it was also absolutely transforming. And what what and I'm not just using that word. It was a transformation of consciousness. I didn't understand anything. I had to be guided and pushed and pulled and just let go and just find truth and share from that. They knew who I was. They saw my devotion and I saw it theirs. It was so beautiful. I was sitting there saying to myself, center everywhere, circumference nowhere. Truth resides right in each of us. And we all knew that. And again, getting out, they could have killed me, but they loved me. They didn't know me, but they loved me. Those YSS people couldn't get enough of being with us. And this is what we're talking about. I had the same experience in Assisi. I had the same experience um, where Padre Pio lived. I mean, people who, they're not thrilled to hear about Kriya Yoga, but where truth resides, those beings who have been able to find their way there, in the end, or we're, we're clearly on the search, nothing else matters. It's a shift of consciousness, and we feel it, and we're all in it together. And there's many other stories that happen like that. You think because Master came and he was Indian that it's all like American India, Ananda India. No, it's not like that. You have to really walk into a different land and very quickly learn their customs and flow with it to be able to move through the experience. But when you get to the depth of each experience, it happens. It happened in stores where I would be buying something and so something would happen with the person I'd just been bargaining with and talked them down $50 or something. I mean, like fighting. And then when the deal was done, it was, we would look at each other. Sometimes words were shared. Who are you? Where do you come from? How, can, how, do, you, how do you learn such devotion? Just feeling it, just knowing it, because that's what truth is. Truth is that, the, the basis of everything, and it's one. And this is why we always say truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. Or why we say at the end of every one of our prayers, these are prayers that were brought to us. And they're brought to us not to just repeat them. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm sorry. But unconsciously, let me say, it wasn't what I was looking for, but not by just rote. No, we have to hear them every week, every time we pray, saints of all religions. We're invoking the presence of the great saints of all religions. Now, I'm in a little trouble here because I didn't bring my glasses and I can't see that clock. So somebody has to tell me what time, what time it is. 10 of 10. Ten, uh, ten of, okay, great. I wanted to just comment, I want to shift a little bit and comment on the Gita reading because it's so meaningful. I was really taken, and I don't have the words now, by what Rita Swamiji's comment on the Gita reading. When, because listen to these, the last words that he says. He says, um, the, this is Krishna, I'm sorry, Krishna in the Gita. The pursuance of another's duty is fraught with spiritual danger. And I thought to myself, fraught with spiritual danger. He's warning Arjuna. 
He's warning all of us, what does that mean? Why is it so important, as Swamiji says, find your own path, go on alone, listen as clearly as you can, because it will not look like anybody else's path. And yet, how many of us, I know it in myself, and I have heard it from hundreds if not a thousand people, that they don't feel like they're living up to something. They don't feel worthy. They don't feel like they're getting it right. What is the it? Very often, watching how somebody else is doing it, watching how long somebody meditates, watching how well somebody can teach, or what a great musician somebody is, on and on and on. And that is not how we make it, in fact, as Krishna said, it's dangerous. It is so important on the spiritual path to listen deeply, to remember, to be asking these great masters, what next? What next? For me, for this soul, what is my dharma? What should that look like? And it doesn't stay the same, just like our bodies don't. Just like I could start my path meditating, sitting flat on the dirt with my knees crossed for hours, and then you move to uh, a bench, and then you move to a chair, and then you're carrying your darn bench around with you. We change. The bodies change. But so is our soul changing. And what was perfect for us just yesterday no longer is. And I realized some of what, as I prayed about it and sat with it, when we're pursuing somebody else's dharma and our soul gets off track, it opens so many doorways for delusion to sneak back in. If we think we need to be a great guitarist like we have, but it's not really our dharma, even if we love music, it really has the possibility to draw the ego so much more in. We think we want to play the guitar like that to get closer to God. But, and for many, it's great, even if it doesn't sound like this, even if this means our couple of great guitarists or our few, even if it's not as good, but you're trying and that's where your effort's meant to be, good, good for you. But this whole idea of asking and receiving, of asking and receiving, and then finding the courage to follow what you hear, what you receive. What will it look like for you? you know, my, one of my last stops in a crazy exchange of energy, I was not supposed to go to Mumbai. I was actually taking myself back to this elegant hotel in Delhi to pamper myself for a day and a half. Until Narayani said to me one night, I just had a thought, why don't you come to Mumbai for a day? Come to Mumbai for a day we were up in Kolkata. I said to her, that is crazy. And then I sat for a minute and I said, but why not, you know? And they are, this, I'll share more about it this afternoon. What they are doing in Mumbai is extraordinary, really, truly inspired and extraordinary. Every, on the material plane, the ashram, they're finding the houses, the cafe, uh, but spiritually, the listening, the being able to be guided. You, you are totally aware of Swamiji's presence the entire time you're there. But I kept saying to myself, be very uh, prayerful, be very mindful, pray about this, because everything that they're doing, it's not what we should be doing, not all of it. There's a lot of the spirit, there's many things that we'll talk about it as time goes on, some of which we can bring in. But if we tried to be Mumbai, it would be a fiasco, an absolute utter fiasco for so many reasons. No, it's their dharma. 
it's not our dharma. And I, I was sort of leaving, holding on, because it's beautiful. It's extraordinary. It has that elegant feel spiritually and physically that was Swami Kriyananda. For those of you who knew him or saw his places, he loved beauty. He didn't think that's what was going to bring him spiritual freedom, but he did feel the way it uplifts our spirit and our soul. And it feels like that. And boy, you should have seen me. I was redesigning our temple at the, I mean, everything, it was getting dangerous. And then I said to myself, you are not in India when you're there. Stop, listen. And we each have to do that personally. And that's what this reading's about. And it's subtle because, the, because Maya gets in and starts defining for us what we should do, how we should be. But to rise above that or to fight that fight, I thought later, all of that, I mean, I'm doing this because this is what you have to do. You could get carried along in a tide of people and wind up miles walking from where you wanted to be just because you couldn't find your way through. We have to find our way through. We have to exert the effort when it's right. We need to see where we're going and then find the courage, the strength, the conviction to get there. So it was perfect. It was being physically manifested exactly what we need to do on the spiritual plane, to find our own dharma, just as Krishna said. Swamiji said one interesting thing. I'll close with this. He said, all of what looks off right now, the politics, the, some of the religious fanaticism, just it's a dark time. We all know that. Now, he was saying this, obviously, before he left his body. And I'm not sure that much more light is here. We still see all of what we see. He said, all of it is being animated by the, so there's a, by the energy of Dwapara. So there's much more energy, but it's still animating that which existed in Kali Yuga. But he said, it, it will change. Watch it, wait for it. It's just the bad looks worse right now. And I thought, that is so brilliant. Of course it was. It's exactly what happens. What's ever there, if you bring a lot of energy to it, it's more. And it just happens to be more of the darkness. But Davy had a very interesting comment about it. She said she was sitting in a meeting one day and she was thinking about uh, the way things look right now. And she, the thought came to her. It's like watching dinosaurs on speed or on what's the phrase on when something gets really wound up speed is it speed anyway yeah well let's just say it speed works not that I've ever tried it but it works dinosaurs on speed so they're you know barging into everything and it's not still a dinosaur time so it looks weird and it really was a perfect image we don't we don't expect to see dinosaurs right now. But instead, we're seeing politicians and fighting with each other and religions fighting with each other and our environment going crazy. And it's like that, but we're headed into Dwapara. So it, it will all change and it's allowing us, if we make the effort, we take the energy and we use it in the right way each of us individually to say, where am I? What do I do? How can I find truth? Re that it exists in every religion is the macroscopic look at it. What we're looking at in each of us is that individual look of it. Truth is one. It's eternal. It's here. All we need to do is open our hearts and listen more with our hearts. Doesn't matter that I sat there for three hours not understanding anything. I absorbed all of it, as did those women around me. The experience was total. It was complete resting in that truth. 
So it looks different, but it's not. Not when we keep going after truth, that it's always there. So let me just stop here. God bless all of you. Standing.